Hi everyone, my name is Jolie McCreary and this video is part one in the unit one series on biological basis of behavior for AP psychology students. This particular video focuses on sleep and sleep disorders. You might notice that this is actually part one of 1B and that's because I've separated unit one into two sections, part A and part B. So here you can see in our unit outline that we're actually nearing the end of the content for unit one. In our previous video series that I was calling part 1A, you learned about the nervous system in the brain. So in this second part, we're going to focus on those last two topics. You can see they're called 1.5 sleep and 1.5 sensation. After completing today's video, you should be able to answer the following questions. How does the circadian rhythm influence our sleep and wake cycles? Can you explain the changes in our brain and body as we move through the different stages of sleep? How do researchers explain dreaming? And can you explain the major sleep disorders? These are the essential concepts that will be covered in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them as they relate to sleep and sleep disorders. So in our lesson about sleep, we'll be talking a lot about sleep and wakefulness. These are both states of consciousness and consciousness simply refers to our subjective state of awareness of ourselves and our environment. Consciousness is more than just being asleep and awake. There are many states of consciousness, things that are more natural like sleeping, drowsiness and wakefulness, but there are other things that happen less naturally when we're deprived of oxygen or we're deprived of sleep, we might be in a delirious state of consciousness or under the influence of a substance, this could alter our state of consciousness and awareness as well, or even through hypnosis or meditation. But with all of that said, in this particular lesson, the college board is concerned that you know the two states of consciousness, sleep and wakefulness. So our sleep and wake cycles are tied to an internal biological set of rhythms. These are referred to as our circadian rhythm. Our circadian rhythm is our 24 hour sleep and wake cycle. That is an internal drive influenced by environmental cues. As you already know, our hormone melatonin is important for regulating our sleep, but it's influenced by light and darkness melatonin production slows with the presence of light and is stimulated by the onset of darkness. This change helps to signal to our body that it's time to sleep or time to wake. Our core body temperature also fluctuates through our circadian rhythm. It typically drops at night, helping us fall asleep and rises in the morning, helping us wake. We're usually unaware of these drives that are pushing us to sleep and wake up until we alter them or upset them, like staying up all night, switching from a day shift to a night shift, or even more drastically changing time zones. Jet lag is a temporary sleep disorder that occurs when a person's internal body clock is out of sync with the time zone they've traveled to. Jet lag occurs because the body's internal clock is aligned with the original time zone, and it tends to be more intense the farther the time zone is or the more time zone you cross. As you already know, researchers can measure brain waves through an EEG, and thanks to thousands of volunteers who have been participating in sleep studies over the years, researchers have been able to identify clear patterns in brain activity throughout different stages of sleep. The College Board wants students to be able to identify those sleep stages based on the EEG patterns. So let's start noticing the differences between the waves and the diagram in the different stages of sleep. So let's start at the top. Alpha waves are what appear when you are awake, alert, and relaxed. So you'll notice in the just before sleep stage, we're having these very short, rapid waves. And these waves look similar to those of stage one. These are alpha waves. This indicates that the brain is active but relaxed, and this is what occurs as a person is falling into light sleep. In stage two, the person shows clear signs of sleep with theta waves. These are longer, but you'll notice they have these quick spikes. These are sleep spindles and K-complexes. In stage three, this is the deepest stage of sleep, and you will see tall, slow waves. These are delta waves, and these indicate deep sleep. The next brain wave depicted at the bottom of the diagram is REM sleep. You enter REM sleep for the first time about an hour after falling asleep. These REM waves are very short and rapid and they resemble those of the waves you see when you are awake. So now that you've learned about brain activity, let's go over what happens in your body during each of these stages. I'll start back up at the beginning. 
As you're starting to fall asleep, you are in what's called stage one, which is also called non-REM one or in-REM one. During this brief stage of sleep, you're drowsy and experiencing very, very light sleep. You might even start to experience hypnagogic sensations as you're entering this stage. Sometimes people confuse this with dreaming, but dreams are used to describe experiences with storylines and sequences of events. Whereas a hypnagogic sensation is a brief sensory experience that can be visual or auditory or even physical. Common examples are seeing a kaleidoscope of colors, flashes of light, or hearing a sound or voices or having a physical sensation sensation of floating or following or the presence of someone or something in the room. You are so lightly asleep at this point that you are very easily awakened and these hypnagogic sensations may cause you to jolt awake or jerk suddenly. Stage two of sleep is relatively light but it's deeper than stage one. Stage three is our very, very deep sleep. In this stage, our muscle activity is very low and we are deeply relaxed. It's very difficult to wake someone from stage three and the person, if they are awoken, will likely feel groggy and disoriented. This is known as sleep inertia. This stage of sleep is crucial for physical healing, recovery, and immune system functioning. And it also plays a significant role in memory consolidation, specifically declarative memories for facts and information. And during this slow wave sleep, our brain replays and strengthens that newly acquired information, transferring it into long-term memory storage. And finally, we have REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement, which is named after the eye movements that are observed during this stage of sleep. REM is considered a paradoxical stage because as you can see in the EEG diagram, our brain activity during REM sleep appears similar to that of when we are alert and awake. During REM sleep, our heart rate and breathing and blood pressure also become more irregular. They tend to increase to levels similar to those when we're awake. The body, though, is very relaxed and we experience muscle atonia during REM sleep, which prevents our muscle movement and prevents us from moving and acting out our active brain state. REM sleep is when we experience vivid dreams and researchers find that the best description of our dreams occur when participants are awoken from REM sleep rather than waiting until the morning. REM sleep is also crucial for consolidating procedural memories, which are memories for skills and habits, as well as emotional processing. During REM sleep, the brain continues to process and organize our memories and integrates them into our past experiences. So now that you're familiar with what's happening in the brain and body during each of these stages, it's important that you understand the cycle of when these stages occur throughout the night. Notice that you will cycle through each stage multiple times before waking in the morning. There are two diagrams here that you can see that help you notice the cycles and the lengths of time you spend in each stage. So now let's talk about dreams. Research findings in both men and women indicate that the majority of our dreams are marked by something negative. And the most common negative themes were reported being attacked, pursued, rejected, or having some kind of misfortune. Most commonly though, storylines often related to recent events things that we just experienced or had been preoccupied by. For instance, in a 2016 study of over a thousand Turkish participants, sleep researchers found that participants who consumed violent media tended to have more violent dreams. And in a 2006 sleep study of musicians and non-musicians, those who were musicians were twice as likely to have reported dreams related to music. There are many theories as to why we dream, but the College Board wants students to be familiar with two of them, the activation synthesis theory and the memory consolidation theory. Theory. So the first theory is the activation synthesis theory, and this particular theory suggests that dreams are essentially the brain's way of making sense of random electrical activity that occurs during REM sleep. Here's how it works. While you're in REM sleep, the brain stem fires off spontaneous electrical impulses that activate different parts of your brain, including those that are tied to emotions, memories, and your senses. And your cerebral cortex, which handles those higher level functionings, tries to make sense of the random activity by weaving it into a story, which becomes your dream. And this theory helps to explain why dreams can be weird and nonsensical, and it's just your brain trying to organize random signals into something that is coherent. 
it. So to summarize, the activation synthesis theory sees dreams as the brain's way of making sense of random signals, and it might help us better understand why dreams seem so bizarre, and it highlights our brain's knack for finding meaning in randomness. So the memory consolidation and restoration theory takes a different angle, focusing on how sleep, especially REM sleep, helps us process and store memories, also noting that this is when most of our dreaming is occurring. So according to this theory, when you sleep, your brain is replaying and reorganizing the experiences and information you gathered during the day and moving them into long-term memory. So it's strengthening the neural connections, helping you integrate new information with information you already know. So it's thought that dreams are a side effect of this process, reflecting on your brain's work and storing and filing away your daily experiences. This is believed to be an essential part of REM sleep and a byproduct is dreaming. So just to summarize the memory consolidation theory, this is believed to be just a process of how we're storing information. And this is highlighting how important dreams are as they are linked to our memory and learning process. Next, it's important that we discuss the consequences of sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation can lead to all kinds of negative consequences, like reduced attention and memory, along with emotional instability, a higher risk of anxiety and depression. It can physically weaken our immune system and increase our risk of chronic conditions like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. It can impair our motor skills and our coordination and can lead to a greater risk of accidents. Sleep deprivation also disrupts our hormonal balance. It affects our hunger and our stress regulation. An interesting anecdote about sleep deprivation is from a high school student named Randy Gardner in 1969 who tried to stay awake as long as possible, and he stayed awake for 11 days. However, he started experiencing frightening symptoms whenever he was depriving himself of sleep. He developed a heart murmur, slurred speech, and he couldn't hold a conversation longer than a few minutes. He also started hallucinating that street signs were people, and he had delusions about who he was. But once he began sleeping again, his symptoms disappeared. Another less extreme example is our practice of daylight savings time where we lose an hour of sleep. It is more uh, common and less extreme than Randy Gardner, but even those few hours of sleep loss have shown a devastating consequence. If you look at the first graph that we see labeled A, it represents the spring. This is before and after we lose an hour of sleep due to daylight savings time. It shows the Monday before daylight savings time and the Monday after, and it shows a comparison between the car accidents before daylight savings time and afterwards. You can see this compared to the fall when we have a time change. In the fall, ordinarily we start with more accidents than we did in the spring, likely due to things like getting darker earlier or possibly weather related conditions. However, when we hit daylight savings time in the fall, drivers get an hour more of sleep and you can see the Monday directly following, there's considerably less traffic incidents. Now, something that's important to keep in mind is that when we deprive ourselves of REM sleep, our body will ensure that we get the REM we need. This is called REM rebound. REM rebound occurs when a person who has been deprived of REM sleep experiences a longer and more intense REM period when they finally do get to sleep. And this phenomenon happens because the brain tries to compensate for the lost REM by increasing its duration and intensity once that sleep deprivation is resolved. And it often results in very vivid dreams and can sometimes be accompanied by disruptive sleep patterns as the body attempts to restore its balance. The remainder of today's video focuses on common sleep disorders. The first is insomnia. Insomnia affects one in five adults and is characterized by a difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep or waking up early and not being able to get back to sleep. Individuals with insomnia often experience reduced sleep quality. It leads to daytime fatigue, irritability, and difficulty concentrating. Insomnia can be caused by a variety of factors, including stress, anxiety, depression, poor sleep habits, or even underlying medical conditions. It can be acute, lasting just short periods, or it could be chronic, persisting for months or even longer, and it might require lifestyle changes, behavioral therapies, or medical treatment to manage effectively.
Next is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a disorder that affects one in 20 adults, and it's characterized by a repeated interruption in the breathing that happens during sleep. And it's often caused by a collapse of the upper airway or a failure of the brain to signal to the body to breathe. And these interruptions can last from a few seconds to minutes and may lead to fragmented sleep, which results in excessive sleepiness during the daytime and a higher risk of cardiovascular problems and other health issues. Symptoms of sleep apnea include loud snoring, choking or gasping during sleep, and then a difficult time staying asleep. Treatment for sleep apnea often involves lifestyle changes such as weight loss or positional therapy, but the most effective treatment is the continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP therapy. CPAP uses a machine that provides a steady stream of air through a mask that's worn during sleep, which keeps the airways open and prevents the apneas. Somnambulism is another very common sleep disorder, but you probably know it as sleepwalking. This is a disorder where individuals perform complex behaviors while asleep. Oftentimes it's walking or moving in their sleep, and this is so common that it affects one in 15 people. It typically occurs during the deep stages of sleep, such as in REM3, which explains why it's often difficult for the individual to wake up from this stage. And many times people who are sleepwalking will have no idea that they've gotten up because many times they return back to their bed on their own or with the help of a family member. Sleepwalking can affect people of all ages, but it's most commonly occurring in children and they tend to outgrow it as they get older. Adults can experience sleepwalking, but it's often associated with stress, sleep deprivation, or certain medications. Treatment for somnambulism often involves improving sleep hygiene and managing stress, as well as just ensuring the sleeping environment is safe to prevent from injuries. The next sleep disorder is narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a chronic sleep disorder that is more rare. It affects one in every 2,000 adults. It's characterized by excessive daytime sleepiness followed by a sudden, uncontrollable sleep attack. This can involve cataplexy, which is the sudden loss of muscle tone triggered by strong emotions, as well as hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis. Narcolepsy affects both children and adults, though symptoms often begin in adolescence and early adulthood. Sleep attacks put the individual at risk of dangerous falling or collapsing at a moment that could cause them harm when they fall. These attacks usually last less than five minutes, but they can happen at bad moments or during emotional times. The last sleep disorder you need to be familiar with is REM sleep behavior disorder or REM behavior disorder. And this affects one in 100 adults and one in every 50 adults over the age of 50. REM behavior disorder is a sleep disorder where individuals act out their dreams during REM sleep due to the lack of muscle paralysis that normally occurs during this stage. This can result in physical movements like kicking or punching or jumping, which can potentially lead to injury to themselves or others. Treatment for REM behavior disorder typically involves medications, which can help reduce or prevent the physical movements associated with the disorder, and ensuring a safe sleeping environment by removing sharp or dangerous objects from the bedroom by using these protective measures can help prevent uh, injuries to the individual. Addressing any underlying neurological conditions and making lifestyle changes to improve sleep quality can also help manage the symptoms. So to close out today's video, let's do some questions for review. Remember, I'll read the question out loud and you'll need to pause to determine the answer. Question number one says, shortly after falling asleep and hundreds of time during the night, Paola wakes up after a loud gasp because she has stopped breathing. Which sleep disorder would she most likely be diagnosed with? Question number two says, which of the following psychological concepts refers to a student's biological clock's sleep-wake pattern that follows a 24-hour cycle? Question number three says, Taylor has been deprived of sleep for several nights. She is now showing increasing amounts of paradoxical sleep. This increase indicates that she is experiencing which of the following? So this concludes today's video on sleep and sleep disorders. Be sure to check the answers to the multiple choice questions below. And also before closing out, make sure that you can answer our key focus questions and define our essential concepts.